I'm incredibly nervous because for the first time uh, in my life, I'm going to tell a personal story. And it is about the summer of 1957. And yes, I was alive in 1957. <laughs> but <laughs> I would really appreciate it if you would collectively gasp and say, no way. Right? <laughs> I was very young. I probably didn't even realize it was 1957. I figured it all out afterwards when I figured out that it was the summer after the short-lived Hungarian Revolution. And during the chaos of that uprising, a couple of my relatives managed to slip through the porous borders. And eventually, they came and they found their way to my family's house in White Plains, New York. And they came and they stayed with us that summer of 1957 in order to, as my mother very confusedly put it, find their feet. I'm, I'm sure that she said that, and I spent a lot of time that summer staring at their shoes. <laughs> there were two of them. Uh, the woman's name was Cousin Elona, and the man's name was Cousin Zonvel, and they weren't married to each other. Uh, Cousin Zonvel slept in our den, and I wasn't allowed to go into the den all summer long because he needed his privacy. And Cousin Alona moved into my room and I moved in uh, with one of my sisters and I slept on a cot. But I didn't mind at all because I loved having Cousin Alona and Cousin Zonville live in our house. Everything about them fascinated me. Uh, first of all, I love to listen to the language that they would speak to each other when nobody else was in the room or just I was in the room. And I would try to imitate this language when I was by myself. It sounded to me like the secret language of mermaids. It was filled with watery music. My mother didn't know this language, so when she was in the room, they would speak English, but they spoke it in their own way, all watery and wonderful. Cousin Alona liked to practice English with me Rebecca, that's, that's how she said it, I loved it, Rebecca. I think that Cousin Alona was more ambitious than Cousin Zonville because she found her feet first. <laughs> and she moved away, and Cousin Zonville stayed with us for a much longer time. My mother also seem fascinated by Cousin Alona and Cousin Zonval. That summer, she spent a lot of time in our living room, just sitting in the middle of the day when she never sat, and drinking tea, and listening to their stories. And I had to be very, very quiet and try to be invisible, because often when she noticed that I was there, she would make me go outside and play in the backyard. A lot of their stories were like fairy tales. They had been really, really rich. They didn't have, their families hadn't had just one house the way our family did, but many houses. And Cousin Alona would always talk about their country house, and how beautiful it was. And I pictured it just like the castle in the Cinderella story. 
And she spoke about the parties, the parties, the parties. They hadn't gone to school the way all the kids in White Plains did. Instead, teachers used to come to their house and teach just them all of the subjects. Cousin Alona told me this when she was practicing her English with me. She had a teacher for English, and she had a teacher for French, and she also knew how to speak German. Do you know how to speak any languages but your own? She would ask me. And of course I didn't, although I pretended to. Cousin Zonval used to wear my father's old brown suit. Every day he would wear the brown trousers, and every evening for dinner, he would wear the jacket no matter how hot it was that summer. He also wore my father's old white shirts, but he had once been a prince. My mother told me this. He still sometimes sort of acted like a prince which means that he was quite rude. <laughs> he was living in our house, sleeping in our den, and he ordered us all around, even my mother. And everybody let him do it. Some of the stories that I heard that summer were extremely frightening. They were like the stories that my big brother used to make up in order to scare me out of my wits. And he always managed to do it, even though I knew that the stories weren't true. But Alona's and Zonville's stories were true, and I knew that they were true because sometimes Cousin Alona would cry. There had been a terrible place. They called it a camp, but it was completely different. And the name of this camp when they said it was so terrible that you heard in it everything that most frightened you about the world, all of the things that the grown-ups told you that you were such a silly child to imagine, you heard in that name. And I would never say that name out loud, not even in a whisper. So I couldn't, it was all very confusing, but I couldn't ask any questions because I knew that if I asked any questions, I would never be able to sit in the living room and listen to their story. So I tried to figure things out for myself. And here's what I figured out. There had been very bad people in the country where everybody spoke the wonderful language of Cousin Alona and Cousin Zonval. And these Bad people had hated Cousin Alona and Cousin Zonval so much that they wanted to kill them. And also, they had wanted to kill all of the people whose names I heard all summer long. And here was the really interesting thing about those names. I knew all of those names because they were the names of all of the kids in our family. It was my name and the names of my sisters and my brother and all of our cousins. And these bad people had wanted to kill them, but they were also very good people. And Cousin Alona and Cousin Zonval had been hidden by these good people. So I heard a lot of stories about the good people. I probably heard more stories about the good people than the bad people that summer. And this gave me an idea. It gave me an idea for a test. Whenever anybody wanted to be my friend, I would think, will she hide me? Will he hide my family? And as people who know me well can tell you, that is still the test that I use till this day. I don't have very many friends. <laughs> the other thing I figured out that summer was that these people 
um, some of whom had been very good friends with cousin Alana and cousin Alona before. These people had told terrible lies about Alona and Zanfal and all of the people who had the names of us kids. And I told lies sometimes too, but I always knew when I was telling a lie, these bad people had believed their own lies. They had made terrible mistakes in their belief. And this also gave me an idea. I wanted to try to figure out whether any of my beliefs were mistakes, and I tried to go through all the things that I believed, which was very, very hard, and see if I could find the mistakes in any of them. The picture that I always got in my head and still get in my head when I think about the terrible mistakes that people make in their beliefs is the picture of Zonville in my father's old brown suit treating us all so rudely and everybody letting him do it because of the terrible things that had been done to him. Many years later, when I was a professor of philosophy at Barnard College, I used to pop into this little kosher takeout food place called Meal Mart on the Upper West Side. And I used to go there in order to um, visit Zonville. Uh, he worked there behind the counter, and he still had his elegant princely manners as he dished out, the ladled out the chicken soup with matzo balls in his white apron that was stained with stuffed cabbage, and his face always lit up when he saw me, and he always insisted on calling me professor very loudly, although it was very embarrassing. Um, and I knew that this was for the sake of his colleagues at Meal Mart. As he got older, uh, his passion was for genealogy. He was trying to trace the lineage of our once illustrious Hungarian family. He had discovered a philosopher among our ancestors back in the 19th century, somebody who had written many books. Uh, he had the titles. It was his great desire to get his hands on one of these books, and he was going to translate it from the Hungarian for me. He was convinced that I had inherited my philosophical genes from this ancestor. And of course, I never told him that the reason I became a philosopher was because of him, because of Zonville. Standing there in my father's old brown suit, in our living room, bringing all of these questions into our house, and the questions that I've spent the rest of my life trying to answer. Thank you.